to make some remarks on the budget in 2019. On the Cade Dog Sheets, I want to acknowledge at the outset that many of the increases that were introduced today by Minister uh, Donoghue I, I are extremely welcome. The cross the board increases in all total welfare payments is something that will be of benefit to a considerable uh, segment of our population. But the uh, ordinary working man is getting less than what increases in the, in the total welfare one. That's very unfair and it's wrong. We must be, uh, make it pay to go to work. I will return to that matter shortly. I want to also say that at the, at the outset, I share on the sentiments expressed by Social Justice Ireland, who have long advocated a guiding vision for Irish society based on the values of human dignity, pursuit of the common good. In his pre budget uh, submission, it, it outlined to us uh, how these values are central to the vision of a nation which all men, women, and children have what they require to live life with dignity and to fulfil their potential, including sufficient um, income, access to the services they need, and active inclusion in a genuinely participatory society. Tourism, if I can begin with, and the issue of the VAT, like the tourism sector, uh, sector as a hike that was expected to, 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 to cost the tourism sector over 400 million euro to the sector. I think this is a really great step. Uh, it was mentioned during the week that um, you might have a, a level, might go to 11 percent. Why didn't you do it incrementally? Because this is, is very unfair. Uh, the, <clears throat> this is really lost opportunity in terms of taxation regime for businesses and the tourism sector in rural Ireland. We were told today that the increase was necessary. Not not only to generate greater income, but also to avoid putting pressure on other areas of taxation. The Minister would have, been, uh, would have us believe that the tax increase is like a golden goose that will help uh, solve the chronic problems in housing, schools and health. This is a classic a penny wise and pound foolish. I think it's just two islands, rural Ireland and urban Ireland. Uh, the Minister tried um, to, 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 try to offset the damage that was being done by saying that he's going to give an additional funding of almost 50 million to help the tourism sector and to mediate the funding to Minister Ross's department. That's only a stop that he got to get him to vote for the budget this morning. This is like saying, I'm going to break your legs, but don't worry, I will give you a nice new pair of crutches to help you along afterwards. We, now, we know from Minister Ross's department that tourism is one of Ireland's most important economic sectors and that it has significant potential to play a further role in Ireland's economic renewal. In 2016, tourism was responsible for um, overseas earnings, which is very important, of 4.5 billion. Combining the data from the domestic market and the international visitors' total, tourism revenue for the economy is estimated to be around 7.8 billion. The tourism sector supports 150,000 jobs in the accommodation and food sector alone, and overall employment in tourism is estimated to be in the region of 220,000. And Minister, you're a rural um, um, talk to Dala. You should know yourself that this is unbearable for rural Ireland, as I said, it's, it's an awful body blow. We also know that from the most recent Central Statistics Office, data that overall, uh, overall visits to Ireland rose by 10.9%, 9,584 million trips. Spending by visitors to Ireland also increased in recent years, with total tourism and travel earnings from overseas visitors, including fares, growing by 9.5% to 6 billion, an enormous amount. <clears throat> in the light of this evidence, it is inconceivable that the Minister has now chosen today to undermine the growth of the only one sector in the state that has shown consistent growth and resilience over the past decade. A rise of 11% was flagged during the week. Why was it necessary to uh, restore it back to the 13.5% in one swoop? How much are we touching? We promised we were promised rural proofing in the programme for government we'd sorted. This is not rural proof by any shape, make or form. How are rural hoteliers and small hotels and tourism related businesses, and there are many, including community ones, going to survive now that this punitive rate has been reintroduced in one foul swoop? It is going to deepen the sense that we are living in two different econo economies, and we are, rural and Ireland, that's patently obvious. Mental health, I want, to go to, I want to mention the provision of mental health funding. As we are aware, the programme for government contains a commitment to uh, improve uh, the provision of mental health services. Yet Tipperary does not have a single mental health bed, not one minister. And it's a huge county. What does it mean when someone like Dr. John Hillary, a consultant psychiatrist and president of the College of Psychiatrists of Ireland, and a colleague and a fellow county, county man of an, 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 an Dr. Dahl and show, Dr. Hackley, uh, say that he was forced to resign his role within the Health Services Executive because he and his colleagues are being ethically compromised? Ethically compromised. 
scale. This is not the first time Dr Hillary has raised these matters. Last year he pointed out that the recruitment issue facing the child and adolescent mental health services, TAMS and general psychiatry services was crippling the service and that the terms and conditions of those working for the HSE were a major issue. It is highly unlikely that any of the measures introduced today will remedy that and will be an epidemic of, of mental health issues in Tipperary and right across the country. The problem is the nature of the system itself. As I said, Tipperary does not have a single mental health bed, not one. Not one. I welcome the increase in the limits for the GP visit card, but I want to know uh, what measures are going to be taken to support general practitioners and our primary care settings. Our GPs need better access to diagnostics and better support in order to uh, relieve pressure on hospitals. This must be addressed, and it's not been addressed, and it hasn't been for a decade or more. I want to move on to housing. Minister Dunham announced a raft of funding measures, yet despite 15 months of broken promises and he had seemingly endless announcements about how this plan is going to solve the crisis and how the plan is going to increase provision of social housing, virtually nothing has been achieved. Nothing. Simon Community in his analysis have informed us that the increasing number of people entering emergency accommodation across the state in 2017 resulted in a budgetary allocation for homelessness services in 2018 of 116 million euro. This included an additional 18 million for wraparound services and running costs associated with the most recent emergency response mechanism, the Family Hub programme. The Simon community has had demanded budget 2019 uh, revise these allegations upwards to meet the needs of people who remain stuck in emergency accommodation and who will become homeless. However, because the structural problems remain in terms of evictions notices and the denial of effective mediation or resolution, the problems look set to remain and the blackguarding that the banks are giving our uh, citizens, in spite of the fact that we're bailing them out and our children and grandchildren will be and probably great-grandchildren. Minister, we have to accept the simple facts. The budgetary process today has not been adequate to deliver the level of housing that we need. The moves towards further engaging our, and, uh, engaging or assisting the local authorities that have been announced today have also not worked. The problem is housing go beyond budgetary allocations, and can you not see that? They require a major shift away from excessive, excessive market reliance and private sector dependency, and that's obvious, and several speakers have alluded to it. I fail to see anything in the budget that addresses this uh, uh, ideology that's part of Fine Gael thinking, and the, sadly the independent alliance have lost out badly. And indeed the labour and, and regional development market. As Minister Donohoe informs us, the labour market is perhaps the best parameter of economic developments at present, given the many distortions in the headline GDP and GNP indicators. To this end, he says that the government will continue to reform the income taxation system in order to ensure that work pays. The government's approach, which is allegedly focused on low- and middle-income earners, is to ensure steady and sustainable progress in reducing the income tax burden in the years ahead. On foot of that, changes made to the self-employed sector are very welcome, even if they do represent but one step in the right direction. The exclusion of self-employed from accessing any social protection payments has been a scandal and an insult to those who provide employment for others, but no safety net of their own in terms of social protection supports. We need to see greater expansion of this, and they suffered greatly during the downturn and recession. Uh, the Minister also says that ensuring competitiveness is a key priority for government. This is why the government says it is providing for a 10-year capital plan to address bottlenecks and promote balanced regional growth that will allow businesses and uh, families plan for the future. I have to say to the Minister, as a reply to that, what planet is he living on? Achieving balanced regional development has been one of a, a, a signal failures of this government, of your government, Minister. You singularly fail and spectacularly fail in this area. I recently highlighted statistics from the Eurostat yearbook that demonstrated over 50% of Ireland's GDP that the total value of everything produced in the country is generated in Dublin. This is despite the fact that an estimated 60% of the population live outside Dublin. When are you going to realise that Dublin is not Ireland and the pale isn't Ireland and outside the pale does matter? You're a junior minister and you should be making these noises and having this your voice heard. Even the European Commission in Ireland have observed that the figures here are way out of kilter with the majority of other EU capitals. And that's obvious figures by renowned institutions. In fact, they have pointed out that since 2004, the, sh the shift in economic activities towards Dublin was the second highest in the EU at 5.5% points. So where are you going to stop it? We're just trying to please all our gods and masters in the EU. 
what are we, uh, why are we continuing to see this budget differ is the total absence of an effective plan to redress the massive imbalance that exists between Dublin and the rest of the state, and we saw that clearly with your swipe and smash and grab on the, on the 9 per cent sector with rural businesses and rural industry. This has to be addressed not only at government level, but also at EU level, where consideration might be given to an idea such as making industrial or other types of grants uh, conditional on development in rural Ireland. This would certainly be consistent with the EU's own agenda of making rural areas viable commercial and industrial um, centres. Education and the increase in the capitation grant by 5% while welcome is simply not sufficient to help schools meet their costs, meaning that schools will continue to rely on hard-pressed parents and parents' councils and board of management to try and fund themselves. The 950 additional SNAs, while welcome, does absolutely nothing to address the current concerns of this sector, who have little or no job security and stability. And you know that better than I do, Minister. The current SNAs employed in schools need to know that they will have a job come next September and every year is totally unfair to them. What have we done to address pay inequality for teachers? This is a scandal in our time, Minister. Yellow pack workers and have teachers working at 13, 40 percent less than their colleagues. This is outrageous, and I thought you were going to make some attempt to start on this uh, Tosak Ma, Elena Hubbard, but you didn't make any attempt. Childcare, the increase in family lim limits for affordable childcare scheme, is of course welcome. But it continues to fail to give all parents full choice in their childcare options. I have continuously called for a childcare tax credit that will allow parents full choice of how they care for their children. Parents that choose to care for their own children in their own home must be supported, and are not being supported, are being undermined. I also acknowledge the increase in the home care, uh, care tax credit by €300, Euro, which of course is welcome, but is not sufficient to make up the loss of an entire income should one parent choose to stay at home to mind their children. Nowhere near it, and there's discrimination against parents in the home by this government, and it's blatant. The middle income parents, as I said earlier, very much welcome the increase in those uh, being brought into the higher tax rate up to €35,500, together with the changes to the USC. Uh, these are our middle income earners who over the past decade have become our working poor. Definitely a new poor with small business people and small farmers. They work hard, uh, they pay for everything and they get very little in return. These are the people who try to work overtime to meet the rising costs of living and are penalised for doing so by being brought into a higher tax rate. So this, um, so this little bit of relief will be welcome, but it will not be sufficient to ease the pressure on our middle income earners. There are the pain, they, these are the parents who don't receive Susie grants for the children, who struggle with childcare costs who are paying mortgages, rising rent levels. They are the parents of sick children who don't receive medical cards, or the parents can't get medical cards themselves. If they have an underlying illness, these are the parents who are struggling to meet uh, rising insurance costs and who are trying to support their adult children as meets, uh, meet them in these, these costs because if young adults can't possibly meet these costs themselves. And that's obvious. And you don't have the social justice, I'll tell you, everybody knows that, Minister. The disability, increase in disability budgets is, of course, welcome. But how far will it go to address the huge waiting list? Young children with special needs waiting 18 months or more for an assessment for needs. When the Disability Act 2015, Minister, in your own government's time, sets down in law that they must have an assessment carried out within three months of application. What good has happened to these disability acts and nice price attitudes if you don't act them? Even after assessment, children who require access to speech and language therapists, occupation therapists, um, psychotherapists and psychologists are left languishing on a long waiting list, meaning that young children are not receiving the early interventions that they require so badly. I want a guarantee that extra funding will be put into employing more therapists and others reducing these waiting lists. It's a crying shame and it's an indictment on your government. Where is the reintroduction of the mobility allowance? and motorised transport grant. Finney McGrath railed about it here for years when we were here on this side of the House. Minister, shame on it now that this does not have to be re reintroduced. Land tax, Minister, I appealed to you last week, I've appealed to you in several budgets. Once again, the government has ignored the calls, and my call certainly, to introduce a land tax on land held uh, over 750 acres of, of a farm. With last conglomerates in Tipperary that we have, like Coolmore, uh, a land around the country, Tipperary, uh, surrounding council, buying up everything. It has become increasingly difficult for young farmers and families 
family farms, to extend their farms, because they simply cannot comp compete against these conglomerates, who are receiving huge tax breaks for their industry, in stalling fees and other supports, pay no tax. We must support our family farms and allow them to be able to compete, to extend and grow. Farmers in Tipperary currently can't uh, compete in the purchase of lands, while the same bodies, as I said, cool more empires, uh, purchase of land, uh, continues to grow and grow and grow. Well over 25,000 acres now. It's just a crying shame, and you refuse to tax them or refuse to touch them. And what kind of a grip have the young ministers? He won't do this. And he didn't do that in the finance bill, but I'll be pushing hard in the finance bill this year to do it because it's an unfair playing field. Uh, the, co the whole cost of, of the package of cigarettes has once again increased, which is welcome to meet the huge uh, uh, the hu head costs associated with smoking. But it's not good, no good as a reven revenue uh, raising measure. It must tackle the huge losses to the state as a result of the whole massive uh, counterfeits um, cigarette smuggling. You do have uh, to continue to tackle this issue of counterfeit cigarettes in the market. Uh, the fines associated with smuggling must be increased drastically to remove incentives and uh, to remove the incentive for the smugglers. The insurance costs both a business and a young individuals continue to cripple our country, and I've seen nothing to address that, not one single reference to it, a huge blight on our, our, our economy. I noticed the Minister made no mention of the National Broadband Plan in his speech. I know Minister Nocton is embarrassed by what's going on. When are we going to get serious about the importance of broadband, and particularly for business in rural Ireland, and students, and farmers trying to fill up their application form? It's totally discriminatory against rural dwellers. And talk about rural profit, it's a farce. We're entitled to the same service, no more, no less, but I'm fair and respect, and you should know that, Minister, yourself. Out. Sorry? Minister, our rural town centres are continuing to die on their feet. Just this week, Tipperary Town, one of my lovely towns of Tipperary, had yet another shop closed on its main street, bringing the number of closed businesses on the street to over 21. Every town is the same, or most of the rural towns. I call for an extension of the Living City Initiative to rural towns to help bring life back to our town centres. I also had called for a reduction on, in our, our relief towards planning costs for the change of use of vacant buildings and shops and support for living over the shop, but, uh, but a mechanism for providing accommodation, uh, deal with our housing crisis, but uh, for smaller households, and re also revitalising our town centre. It's a no-brainer. Just uh, tell the county council to waive the charges. Get these delicate buildings uh, rejuvenated. Get the economy boosted by doing them. Get people living in the houses, off the housing list, we have over 3,000 temporary, and bring life back to our, our main streets and our centres. Health Minister, I welcome the increase in the National Treatment Purchase Fund to try and alleviate our huge waiting lists. A waiting list for treatment for our sick and elderly should be a huge source of shame to all of us in here, especially the government. We have elderly people waiting over three years for hip operation, cataract treatment, children waiting for orthopedic treatment, uh, scoliosis treatment, and so on. The end is listless. Is in this. How far will this funding go to reduce these waiting lists? When the numbers we have in trolleys uh, reach crisis by the even today, but above all, today was a beautiful day, uh, above all, throughout the hottest summer in years, how, uh, how are our hospitals going to manage during the winter? Unless we address our staff recruitment and retention issues and health services, we will continue to suffer and just not positive, positive about the measures. The budget will also allow for major changes uh, to the fair deal, which I welcome, which we saw in health for, and I want to, our own independent, rural independent group had a motion on this last year, and I want to thank Maura Canning as well for the help she gave us at the IFA. Under the existing regime, farm families are required to set aside 7.5% value of their land annually to fund a place in a nursing home. From next year, the bill will be capped, and that's only fair like everybody else. This is in line with what we, as I said, rural independence sought for. Minister, you've missed the golden opportunity. You, like I said last year, was like a shower of snow, scattered wildly and to melt away everything else. An uh, election budget, certainly, but you failed, I mean, to deal with the health. 800 million that we're looking to get from uh, extra copper tax sucked in again to a black hole of the HEC and you refuse to tackle it. There's some great people working in the HEC but the waste that's there and the amount of, uh, amount of management layers and structures and we see the failure in the so sad funeral this evening and so many other funerals of another lady in Dublin yesterday, and many more to come. Death sentences have been sentenced on those people and no one held accountable. And your minister refuses to, be, uh, to resign or have any shame or hang his head in shame. Minister, the HSC is just absorbing every year since I'm here, now 10 years, it is growing by the bill in every year, the funding into it, with very, very little outcomes and waiting lists. And my colleagues here in front of me, the Dr. Hilly Rays and Michael Collins and others, including myself and Dr. Bringing people to Belfast and buses at weekends to get simple, basic treatments. That we have volunteers going out to third world countries, volunteer doctors, doing these operations, 20 minute operations, and we can't have them for our own people here. We send them up to Belfast. Minister, 
You have failed to grasp the nettle in housing and in health and indeed justice. Our Gareth Shikana, as Deputy Healy Ray said, in temporary huge cuts to overtime. We expect him to be the peace line between us and anarchy. And I salute him for the work to do and be threatened in early September with overtime cuts for the rest of the year. It's an outrage and an insult to those people. Some are sleeping in cars. Some are living in Gareth working in Gareth Station like Tan Mill, and are fit for animals that are mind say humans or are, are, are Gardaí or are, are, are indeed any prisoners or visitors that come in there. You're failing to neglect the most basic. We were in our army personnel who were inside in waiting in Syria to come home for two weeks and he just kind of laughed at it. They'll be mm -hmm. home in two weeks' time in spite of the service that the gallant service they've given us here in this country. Minister, it's missed opportunity and it's very, very sad. Good morning,